This is a watercolour impression of the Octagon Room to depict our vision of how the room would look when we had finished our redecoration of it and our restoration of the Regency scheme that the second Lord Berwick had. And we commissioned this from Peter Breers, who'd worked with us on other rooms in the house for the dining room and the domestic spaces. And he's a brilliant draftsman. And his vision actually helped us justify the scheme to people and explain it to them, including experts and advisors that we were working with. So it's been a really useful tool in interpreting and publicising the scheme and getting people to become excited about how it would look. Without any, any doubt at all, I think it's a tremendously good colour. We had to also think very carefully about the textiles and the colours that we were wanting to introduce in the form of curtains and carpets and trimmings. The decision was made to replace the curtains in these three rooms, the inner library, the antechamber and the octagon room. And all of these rooms had the same description in the 1827 sale catalogue of pink striped tabaret lined with scarlet tammy. They obviously were not sold because wonderfully the remnants of this fabric and the trimmings still survived in store and therefore we were able to copy the fabric. It's taken us several years to work out, to do trials and test all the different fabrics that we wanted to use. And there are very few suppliers left in this country who are capable of reproducing these textiles as they would have been made historically. The silk has to be woven specially to the right colour to match the original, and that took several trials to get it absolutely right. We went to several different firms. It's not that fine, it's just it's got a really, really heavy glaze on it who specialise in different techniques in order to achieve the different trimmings. So the Parisian fringe, the little tassels that are suspended from the curtains, which are pink and black silk, hand-woven onto wooden bobbins. The fringe we know was described as a Parisian fringe in the, in the, in the catalogue. That did not survive at all, but we recreated these copying similar fringes that survived from this period and gave them the striping, as you can see, with the scarlet and the black combination. The black stamped velvet ribbon was a particular challenge because it used historically a technique called gaufrage, which was a mixture of applying heat and pressure to crush a pattern onto the velvet. So it would give you a sort of textural finish as well. And we had lots of historic survival of that ribbon. But in order to find a supplier or somebody who was capable of doing that technique in this country today proved incredibly difficult, in fact impossible. Uh, we would have had to have gone abroad to France. But we managed to work with a leather conservator who embossed leather and he invented actually a little machine. He had a brass roller carved specially for the continuing pattern of tulips to stamp on the ribbon and he fed this ribbon through the machine, wrapping it round the roller so that with, with the pressure of the roller he stamped this pattern onto the ribbon. And we tried several different types of velvet ribbon, some of which didn't work, they wouldn't take the pattern. But finally, I think it took us two years just to achieve the black stamped velvet ribbon. This was really invaluable because it's one of the uh, fragments of the historic striped um, tabaret that we had surviving in store. So this was a, an example of the original fragment of the original silk with the black threads attached down the side which indicate where the black stamped velvet ribbon was originally and gave us a really good pattern for working out the allocation of the ribbon and the colour of the lining which was attached to the back of the silk. And the lining was a tammy, which is a glazed wool, and these threads were invaluable because they gave us the colour of that lining. In the inventory or the sale catalogue, that was described as scarlet. In Ingillo's pattern books, that is how they uh, described with a swatch that colour. We would call it today a brick red or a terracotta. I've brought one of the girls from the workshop today who's hand sewing all the rings beautifully. It's a special, it's not an embroidery thread, it's more an upholstery thread, but she's taking it through about 20 times and then locking it so you can kind of hang off the curtains. Not advised, but you can do. All the trimmings are sewn on by hand, which they would have done, so we've tried not to use modern sewing machines. All we've done with the sewing machine is sew the widths of fabric together, then everything else is put together. Uh, by hand with hand stitching. So you kind of create the drape of the cloth how it would have looked with hand stitching in those days. Because if you do a machine <laughs> stitch, it's much tighter 
so the fall of the cloth isn't as good. So we followed true methods, basically. You need it, you just need it, don't you? It looks right. It looks at home in the room, doesn't it? I'm installing them as they would have installed them at this particular period. So literally with tacks and a hammer crashing through the beautiful cloth, which is a bit kind of criminal, but it's what was expected then. They weren't as precious as we are today. But what we do with the swags, which we do with all swags, is we make a template first, rather like going and having a, a suit made at Savile Row. You'll have a kind of fitting made in lining. We do a very similar thing with these, which is how they would have done it in this particular period of history. So something's made in calico or muslin to the shape and brought to site and tried out. So we did all that first before we cut the real cloth. Well, we're standing at the moment in the anteroom, which is really the space between the library, the inner library, and the study, the octagon room. The curtains were the object, that, the item that linked them all together. And what's rather amusing, I mean, one may wonder why did these curtains survive and not elsewhere in the house and it was because possibly because by 1829 people didn't really want pink striped tabaret lined with scarlet which looks like orange today I mean they are pretty vibrant but they were absolutely the fashionable de rigueur choice of the period around 1813 which is when they were originally made it was a very satisfying project to see craftsmen today um, go to a huge amount of trouble to try, try and re recreate the fabric and the trimmings Today is a really exciting day because finally after about three, four years of researching, thinking, planning, consulting and trialling, we're actually putting down the new carpet in the octagon room through this little lobby behind me here. Yeah, I'm just feeling really, really excited and there's a huge sense of anticipation because I'm nervous, I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to seeing the carpet, but this has been such a long time coming that you're sort of quite hesitant about it. Putting the carpet down, these guys come in and do it quite quickly, and in some senses it happens before you realise it. So it's odd having that long build-up of time with all the trialling and the discussion and the agonising over trying to get the colour and the details absolutely right. When it actually happens, as it is today, it's over quite quickly and you're just hoping that it looks wonderful and it looks right in the room. The lining paper we use is to prevent any soiling coming through from any gaps in the floorboards and the detail from under the architraves and skirting boards. This is to prevent soiling of the arms which could actually penetrate through the end of felt and into the backing of the carpet, which obviously is to prevent that happening. The felting that we use is of a man-made fibre and the reason behind that is their trust would prefer to use a fibre which is synthetic to eradicate any problem with infestation at any property. So the carpet is a Brussels weave carpet, which is as it was historically, and Brussels means a loop pile as opposed to a Wilton carpet, which is a cut pile. So the cut pile has a, a more velvety, a luxurious appearance, and the Brussels has a more matte. I wasn't, oh, you see, I wasn't even prepared for it coming in, wow. All we had to go on in terms of the appearance and the description of the carpet was some guy in 1827 coming to do the catalogue for the bankruptcy sale. And he would have walked into this room and he described the carpet that was in here as blue ground, crimson scroll and rosette. And that's what we had to go on. We had no fragments, we had no picture, we had no photograph obviously, 
So we just had to make educated guesses looking at archives, looking at the existing scroll and rosettes that we have in the plasterwork of the ceiling, looking at the colours that they were using at that time, the combinations of the crimsons and the blues. So actually seeing it then manifesting itself physically is really amazing. And you're just hoping that if that same person walked back in, or whoever, if they came in to catalogue this, would you describe this as blue ground, crimson scroll and rosette? And I hope that you would. We've worked with a company who still weave carpets in the traditional way on narrow historic looms, whose carpets were only able to be woven in 27 inch width strips and that was the traditional way of doing it. And this company is in, locally in Kidderminster, is still able to produce carpets to that width. So that means that the carpet has to be seamed by hand for every 27 inch width strip. And that's been done off site before they bring the carpet here today to lay it. So our start point is the centre line from window and your door, which is the main entry into the octagon room. We have to put a straight line down as a spring line and then we pin and then stretch away from a given centre line. Leading through the passageway into the ante room, we also have another line. Because there's a difference in the length of the ante room in comparison to the octagon room, we need to open the two sections down so that we can achieve a connection and make sure that we are, we cannot cut into any section until we physically know that we're going to achieve our aim of reaching the lengths of both rooms. Once we've done that, then we can proceed to the main installation section of it. It's closed. That's closed. That's fine. I'm very impressed actually. I think the colouring is exceptionally good now that I've actually seen it in position with the colouring of the uh, fabrics on the curtain drapes. I think it's very good. Although the nature of the room is of dark appearance, it's actually the colouring actually brightens it up. And I think it looks lovely in its place. One of the interesting things about this room as well is the strong use of the colour pink. Although there's a masculine space, Pink in the Regency period was not necessarily considered exclusively feminine colour as we would think of it today, but it was really just an opulent, lavish, extravagant colour, full of impact, because this room was all about the second Lord Berwick saying, look who I am, look how much money I've got, and look how I'm able to create this lavish, bold scheme which was following the footsteps of people like the Prince Regent in London at Carlton House. So he was following fashion, wanting to make a bold statement in this room. Now that the textiles have gone in, the curtains have been in for about a year and the carpet went in a few months ago, there's a real sense of achievement that we've come a long way in this room and the anteroom next door and that they're really starting to feel like fully furnished rooms again. There's still a long way to go, we've still got some of the seat upholstery to do, we've got a replica desk to make to fill the gap that the original took. Already it's starting to feel like a really furnished space and it is a huge sense of achievement to have come this far and to get the room looking like this, to have impact once again and to feel like an exciting, bold, opulent space. This is the kind of redecoration that doesn't happen very often at all. In fact, it's very rare to be able to undertake a scheme of this scale and this expense and to be able to spend enough time and focus on it to make sure that we as much as we possibly can get all the detail right and think about how everything fits together which is hugely important to make sure that we have a holistic approach to the interior so that we're thinking about every single element of it. So it's an unusual thing to be able to do and it's a great privilege also to be able to be involved with it. We're really hoping with all our monitoring and housekeeping standards that this scheme will last well into the future, in fact for at least another hundred years as part of Attingham's future. Mm -hmm.